and welcome. Today we're talking about thorium. What is it and does it hold the key to South Africa's energy and water crisis? That's what we're finding out. I'm Nozi Pombandra and this is Resource Watch. So let's kick off with the market wrap for this week. The HP Billiton is to pay 25 million US dollars for gift trips to dozens of foreign government officials to attend the 2008 Olympic Games. The US Securities and Exchange Commission says the mining giant violated the US foreign corrupt practices. Exaro Resources shares are still at the will of the iron ore price. They fell to a five-year low on the JSE this week. This after it said earnings may drop at least 20% because of lower income from its Sishan iron ore mine. And South Africa's Chamber of Mines says the local mining industry cannot absorb a 25% increase in electricity prices that power utility ESCOM wants. The Chamber says if the tariff increase is granted, marginal gold and platinum mines may be forced to close. Now, thorium is characterized as a safer, less expensive and a simpler form of energy generation compared to uranium reactors. And it could help provide clean water. To explain how this all works, I'm joined now by Trevor Blench. He is the chairman of Stienkam Skral Thorium Limited. Trevor, it's always lovely to have you. Um, and I want us to take a couple of steps back and perhaps start off with what is thorium um, and what does it do in essence? Thorium is a naturally occurring element and it is radioactive. Uh, and it occurs in mines like Steenkamp's Kroll, which is a uh, unique uh, thorium deposit. Uh, and it can be converted into a fuel which can generate an immense amount of power. How much of, uh, of this uh, fuel do we have or this uh, extractive do we have in South Africa compared to uh, global deposits elsewhere? Well, Steenkamp's Kroll is a very uh, special deposit because it's the highest grade thorium deposit in the world with about 2% uh, thorium. It's also a very rich rare earth deposit with about 16% rare earths, which makes it interesting from that point of view as well. An interesting thing about thorium, though, is its relative abundance. Mm. Uh, uranium uh, could be in short supply within 10 or 20 years, uh, whereas thorium, there's three or four times more thorium in the world than, uh, than uranium. And it is widely distributed throughout the world, so it could provide a source of energy for the world for hundreds of years. So now you've brought uranium into the equation, and oftentimes uh, these two extractives are confused. What are the fundamental differences between the two? The most important one, I think, from an energy generation point of view is the nature of the waste. Uh, many people are anti-nuclear because the waste is a big problem mm. from two points of view. Firstly, the waste contains from uranium, contains plutonium, which can be used to make atomic bombs. So there's a proliferation risk with the uranium fuel cycle. The second issue is that of waste storage and management. The uranium fuel cycle produces minor actinides in the waste, which although they're called minor, create a major problem for storage manage and management. The reason why is because they, some of them are intensely radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years and it creates a very big problem in that, in that way. Thorium, on the other hand, produces no plutonium in the waste, so there's no proliferation risk or a much reduced proliferation risk. And in addition to that, there are practically no minor actinides. There are fission products, which are radioactive for a few hundred years. Uh, that is reasonably they're relatively easy to manage right. compared to the hundreds of thousands of years associated. So if, if, uh, if thorium is, uh, is, is safer and it can be stored in a safer way and it's, it has no association with potential usage in atomic bombs, why is it not getting the traction in terms of being identified as a strategic resource uh, in South Africa? What is that barrier uh, that makes uh, thorium relatively unknown to, to the ordinary consumer? Well, this is the case all around the world. A lot of research was done on thorium in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, but that research was mainly uh, research into uh, whether thorium could be used to make bombs. Uh, unfortunately, the atomic age started at a very bad time during the Second World War when there were military imperatives to make bombs, and then after the Second World War there was the Cold War and the arms race with the Russians and the British and the Americans and the French, 
And uh, most scientists were trying to find out how to make bombs with radioactive materials. And so a lot of research was done into thorium. It was found that it was very difficult to make bombs with it uh, by the Americans and the Russians. And so it was abandoned. And uh, now we want the power without the bomb making yeah. uh, problems. So it fell off uh, the, radio, the radar in essence. But uh, we're now looking at a new geopolitical landscape. We're in a new political area uh, globally. In South Africa, given the opportunity that this uh, potential has for the country, are those who are policymakers reviewing uh, thorium? Are we considering it as part of the energy mix in South Africa? Uh, I think there's only a, a bit of curiosity about it at this stage uh, in South Africa. But this is true in most parts of the world. Mm. Uh, in our program in Norway, we are the first people uh, to actually manufacture thorium fuel to place it in a reactor for a qualification program. And we hope that we will complete this qualification mm. program within about three years and license it for use. So it is a long and difficult process to qualify a fuel for use in, in nuclear reactors because the safety issues are so important. Uh, but once we've completed that, I think there will be a great interest around the world. Could it be a, a, a game changer to South Africa's energy crisis? Could this be a big part of the solution that we're looking for? Yes. In South Africa, we have enough thorium to provide power for South Africa for 100 years, used in the right way, with the right reactor technology. So a potential solution to the energy crisis, but there's also another looming crisis, and this is the water crisis. And oftentimes, as this also gains uh, dominance and visibility, the two crises are looked at together. Uh, is there a, a, a role that thorium could play in also addressing some of the water issues that we're facing, not only as a country, but uh, in the region broadly? Yes. We plan to use thorium in a high temperature gas cooled reactor. And uh, I mentioned that it's a bit technical, but this is a kind of reactor that can purify water very efficiently. Uh, there's great interest in our reactor uh, technology from the Middle East where they've got very great water problems. Uh, but this could apply here as well. We can clean, purify, desalinate water with this small modular reactor, including for instance the acid mine drainage problem here in Johannesburg. Uh, and desalinating seawater around the coastal regions. What do you need to happen uh, for, for thorium to really become part and parcel of the energy mix and be positioned as uh, an option for, for the water crisis in South Africa? If you could have a policy lever addressed, what would that be? We need to license the fuel, which means going through the process we're doing in Norway now, but then to license it in South Africa with the National Nuclear Regulator here in South Africa. Mm. And we've already discussed it with them uh, uh, on several occasions. And then also license the small modular reactor design that we have. Um, so this is a, these are processes that will take a few years, mm. uh, but what we need is, uh, let's say, uh, a sense of urgency to make it happen as quickly as possible. And what has been your experience uh, with the licensing uh, process? Uh, we have not started the licensing process yet in South Africa. We've had discussions with the NNR. We would like to commence that process uh, before the end of this year. Mm. And before we wrap, let's just bring into context the pricing of thorium, if it were to come into market. How does it compare, uh, for example, uh, with other uh, uses, or with other sources rather, that could be used in the energy mix? Is this necessarily a cheaper option? Yes, we believe thorium will be cheaper than uranium uh, because there is more of it uh, and because there's um, uh, the uh, problems associated with the waste are not so serious, so the cost of managing the waste uh, it will be less. Uh, but the, the <laughs> perhaps the most important thing to realize about thorium is the immense power that can be released from it. Uh, the energy that thorium can release is a million times more per kilo or per ton than burning fossil fuels. Uh, and so it's releasing that in a way that is clean and safe. That is the our objective. Mm. Well, there you have it. Uh, that's uh, Trevor Blench. He is the chairman of Steenkamp Skrull Thorium Limited, speaking to us about the opportunities uh, that thorium uh, represents and the potential for it to be one of the most important breakthroughs we could make in terms of both our energy and our water crisis in the country. Let's move now to our gem of the week.
Mining was the driving force behind the history and development of South Africa following the early discovery of diamonds in 1867 and gold in 1886. In August 2012, the industry made global headlines for all the wrong reasons. The Marikana massacre was the culmination of a series of violent incidents and resulted in the deaths of 44 people on the 16th of August. But South Africa's crucial mining sector is once more stable. The country holds massive reserves of a variety of precious metals and stones, most notably platinum, chrome and manganese. You can make a strong argument that the entire South African economy is probably a result of, of the mining sector. I just have to look at Johannesburg uh, and, and go back to where it started as a mining town, really. Um, but more formally, if we look at construction, I guess construction is the obvious one from an infrastructure basis in and around the mines. Um, and then broadly, if you're looking at uh, things like explosives and fertilizer, uh, those are industries that tap onto it. And then finally, manufacturing and manufacturing from a few bases. Um, we know that some of the, the bigger engineering businesses supply quite a lot of their goods, um, the likes of in South Africa, Hideko and Victors, they supply the mining industry. So those are broadly the industries that do or, or uh, derive a lot of their revenues from mining. Despite global pressures from rising labor costs, falling commodity prices and slowing global growth, industry leaders remain confident of the sector's future growth prospects. And that's it for this week's show. Do stay in touch on Twitter. That's by following me at The Real Nosy. And of course, using our hashtag, which is Resource Watch. Until next time, it's goodbye.